Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Molly Crowther. I work in security um, for Cloud Foundry at Pivotal. I'm a senior technical program manager. Um, I'm here to talk about healthy, agile product security. So hopefully you're in the right place. Um, I want to start with a quote from Nikki Allen from this morning that I really, really liked, um, just in time. Um, so she was saying, culture will eat strategy for lunch. Um, it's kind of why I'm here talking about culture rather than talking about strategy. Um, we've definitely found that we can kind of close ourselves off in dark rooms and philosophize about uh, strategy all the time. We can talk to people about it, um, but what happens is when you do that, people don't actually take it to heart and they don't use your strategies in the moment when they need to make decisions. Um, and that's one thing that's really important about security is that it's a constant thing. It's not something you worry about as you're about to release something. It's not something you worry about on Tuesdays. It's something that everyone has to be thinking about all the time. Um, so like management and executives and people like me can like pretend that we have this wonderful strategy and then when you know a developer needs to make a decision um, at 5 p.m. on a Friday about what they're gonna do about something, that's where culture, um, culture comes into play. Um, and the talk's gonna be about that, um, specifically for security. Uh, and if you're wondering, why am I qualified to give you this talk? Um, this was a tweet <laughs> from uh, Josh McKenty during CF Summit Europe. I think that kind of uh, stands on its own. Um, so I wanna give credit to Justin Smith uh, for this emoji. Uh, he did a talk at Spring One last year about the three R's, which is our Pivotal's uh, corporate security strategy. Um, I would encourage you to go back and watch that talk. It's really great. Um, this emoji is officially known as fearful face. <laughs> uh, and when he used this emoji, he was talking about um, what customers look like when he comes to talk to them about how to secure data uh, in, their, you know, in their environments. Um, so he's out in the field with customers, um, but as a program manager, my focus is on the Cloud Foundry product teams and helping secure their own products. Um, I would say that before we started really focusing on our security culture at Cloud Foundry, this is a face that developers would give me as I was just like walking around the office. Um, I would like go up to people and they'd be like, oh my God, what's wrong? And I'd be like, do you wanna go get lunch at the food trucks? Um, like I'm not coming to be mad at you or whatever, like, you know, I'm a normal person. Um, but I definitely still get that face sometimes. Um, I also get this face uh, because I like to bake and sometimes hand out treats. Um, and that's, you know, that's all the advice I have. Just make cake. Um, I'm not actually expecting like tears of joy from teams when I come and walk around and like try to um, talk to them about a security issue. Um, but like I think I want them to be kind of more like this. Um, not that they're wearing sunglasses, but that they, uh, when we talk about security, like you can be calm about it, you can be curious. Um, if you know what to do, um, that definitely helps those things. Um, but this is security, right? Like, aren't people supposed to be really scared? Um, maybe. It's hard to get work done when you're scared all the time. Um, I think a lot of us have found that um, in different working environments. Like when you're afraid, that's not when you're gonna be doing your best work. And that's what we need, what we need them to be doing is doing their best work. Um, so I'm gonna talk about how we can do this, uh, be more secure, not terrify people, um, not be like that, be more like that. Um, so yeah, you know from the title of this talk that this is a culture talk. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, and I'm hoping you learn something new. Uh, so the word culture, uh, before you even like start talking about it, um, and before it was like a fancy business word, um, it has something to do with um, growing, tending to something, um, nurturing something, right? So um, this is one of my favorite quotes about culture. Um, basically just says that culture is a living organism. We have to take care of it. Um, 
if you nurture your culture, people will be able to do your, their best work. If you don't nurture it, um, it will make creative thinking impossible, which is something that we want. Um, so in short, you can think of culture as this collective thing, but we can consciously design it. It's not something that happens by accident. Um, you can create a healthy culture, you can create an unhealthy culture depending on how you focus your strategy. Um, the other thing is culture is made up of values, behaviors, and practices, um, and I'll be talking more about that as well. Um, so we wanna design kind of the system of culture at security at Pivotal um, to set people up for success. And we also wanna nurture it so it can become self-sustaining. Um, so in 2016 is when we started really focusing on the security culture at Cloud Foundry. Uh, when that part of the program started, um, we didn't really have a culture at all. Like it wasn't that we had an unhealthy culture, it was that we didn't have one, it was kind of like a vacuum. Um, so we didn't have practices set, the behaviors were kind of all over the place, um, and people didn't know what their values were. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about a security incident um, that we had in the beginning. Um, so at Cloud Foundry, we have something called flex hour. Um, normally engineers are pairing all day, but from the hour of like five to six, we encourage people to, um, they can solo for a while, they can work on something that's kind of peripheral to their normal job, but it just gives them a little bit of flexibility at the end of the day. Uh, we had certain people who would sometimes use that flex hour to uh, try out new tools, just like test things in Cloud Foundry, just like see what's going on. Um, so we had someone um, who was trying out Burp Suite, which is a great uh, like network inspection tool, and he decided that it would be a good idea at 5 p.m. on a Friday to try that out, try out some like password resetting functionality and just like see what happened. Um, I think a lot of the people within Pivotal know like what CVE came out of that. It was a pretty, pretty great CVE. Um, but the question is like, as an engineer, if you're doing that, like what is your reaction? Like what do you actually do if you find something at 5 p.m. on a Friday? Um, and thankfully, he, I was in New York, he was in New York at the time, he reported it to me because he knew I was working on security. Um, but like he didn't actually know if that was the right thing to do because he's like, is this gonna make people work on the weekend? Are people gonna be mad at me that I found this? Like should I not have been testing like just because it's Friday? Um, so that's kind of like an example of like where there was a question and we didn't actually have that culture completely set. Um, so the other thing was that we had a couple, you know, we've had security incidents, which is usually people reporting things to us um, about vulnerabilities, not like particular data breaches. Um, and after those would happen, we would have incident retrospectives where we kind of look back at what happened um, try to figure out what we can do better next time um, in terms of response. And the responses that we were getting in those incident retros were a lot of um, like fear-driven, extrinsically motivated, like chaotic behaviors. Like I didn't know what to do. No one would tell me what to do. I didn't know who to talk to, um, things like that. And that really showed us that it wasn't that we had an unhealthy culture, it's that we didn't have a culture at all. Um, I do uh, admit that I think that we had an easier time of it than a lot of other organizations because we didn't have to break down the walls of an unhealthy culture. We just had to build a healthy one. Um, so take that with a grain of salt. Um, and yeah, so, so to give you kind of more of an idea of how can you recognize like a new forming culture versus an unhealthy culture. Um, I would say that a forming culture is inherently curious. Um, people want to know what to do. Um, they might be a little bit scared about doing the wrong thing or saying the wrong thing. Um, but like we can build in practices to make sure that they feel safe um, and so that they can stay curious as like the culture keeps growing. Uh, I would say an unhealthy culture is not curious. Um, people know what they have to do to stay out of trouble, um, which is not something you want uh, when you're trying to you know, find security vulnerabilities um, that can make people feel unsafe. 
Um, and in an unhealthy culture, people are also aren't going to try new things because they know um, that when they've kind of stepped out of the bounds previously that they've been bitten for it. Um, so I want to give you another really quick example. Um, this is kind of like a, an example from a previous job. Um, but if you can think of a situation where, um, like let's say you had a production downtime incident over the weekend. Um, and this, like, that counts as a security incident because, uh, you know, availability is part of security. If someone can't access uh, legitimately uh, your service, then that's a security incident. Um, if, if your security culture is still forming, I'd expect, like, there to be some confusion uh, about what stakeholders need to be, um, like, if you set up a bridge, like a conference bridge, like, who would need to be there, what you might want to talk about. Um, you might not share enough information uh, but your team's probably looking into why the issue happened, how they're going to fix it, things like that. Um, they like, if they come in on Monday morning and have a check-in with executives or something, like they might have some hesitation, but like they probably know how to how to move forward and, and fix the incident like as the the week progresses. Um, in an unhealthy security culture, which I have directly experienced. If you have a check-in on Monday morning with executives, um, the executives will get on the call, tell you that it's unacceptable, that the team hasn't fixed the issue yet, like attempt, uh, attempt to get you to explain, um, make you kind of write it out to them in a non-technical way so they can share with their bosses so they don't get in trouble and you still get in trouble. Um, and I think in those cases, like the team's pretty likely to leave the meeting like resentful uh, and like knowing they need to get the site back up, but only because they'll be in trouble if they don't do it, not because like they care about value to the customer, right? Um, so in a healthy security culture, what this would look like would be stakeholders informed over the weekend, um, people show up to work on Monday, there's a meeting already on their calendars. Um, it's probably just a quick check-in because everybody already knows what they're doing. Um, hopefully executives are uh, they care about understanding the issue, but they know that like you'll have a retrospective after it's over where they can actually like get the details without interfering um, with getting the incident resolved. Um, and hopefully, you know, everybody would leave that sort of meeting with um, clear next steps on what to do. So it's kind of like an example of the three different um, three different approaches. A um, couple of real examples from the news. Um, I've redacted the company names here and replaced them with emoji um, because like the names of the companies aren't important. Like these sorts of issues can happen to anyone. Um, data breaches uh, in particular. Um, I really believe that if you have an unhealthy security culture, like this is what gonna, is going to happen. Like breaches happen all the time and people respond to them in effective ways. Um, but if you have a security culture that doesn't, uh, doesn't encourage your people to act the right way and do the right thing, then this is what's going to happen. People are going to hide things from you. Uh, they're going to blame other vendors. Um, you know, they're not going to make the right decision in the first place um, to like, secure people's data. Um, so we don't want to set people up for failure. We want to set them up for success. Um, this should be familiar to most people here. Um, these are uh, values that we hold very deal, dear at Pivotal. Um, values are part of what you need to build a healthy culture, right? It's values, behavior, and practices. Um, so these are really vague, and in practice, they can be difficult to apply. Um, so you still need practices to, to back all of this up. Um, but they're easy to use to evaluate a situation. Like anytime you're in a situation and you're not sure what to do, you know that if you're kind, you're doing the right thing and you're doing what's actually gonna work, that you're probably gonna be okay. Um, and like in the unhealthy example I gave um, with the production incident, like were executives being kind when they, you know, give blame, don't actually try to help like, it's not kind, it doesn't work, it's just not the right thing to do. Um, and the other thing about culture is that you do have to nurture it, but once it's up and running, it's not something you have to micromanage. Um, like, I don't think 
people like walk around the pivotal office today and are like, did you like, did you remember to be kind? Like, did you remember to do the right thing? Like, that's not something that happens. Like, we bring it up if we need to make a decision about something, but it's not something that you're constantly poking people about. Um, and these, it takes practice. It always takes practice. Um, this is my dog, Rory. <laughs> I had to sneak a slide in, in about her. Um, so what's the actual like outcome on a personal level of what we want to happen within a healthy security culture? I think my dog, Rory, is a very good example of like a good security professional. Um, <laughs> most of the time, she's very happy, she's very friendly, um, but she is very concerned about the biggest threat to our house, which is cats. Um, very, very, it's a big problem. Um, so she's also like an opportunistic pen tester. Um, we have fences in the backyard that she will continuously uh, check to make sure she can't get out and that there aren't any cats behind them. Um, so she's very persistent and very curious, but like she really cares about security. So everyone should be like her. Okay, so here we're, we're actually getting into, into the nitty gritty here. So um, this is our vision for security culture at Pivotal um, in terms of practices and behaviors. Um, so I'm just gonna go through these really quickly. Um, you can get a lot more information on our corporate long-term strategy through um, any of Justin's talks about the three R's. Um, that's basically where, where we start from. Um, the second one is continuous improvement. Um, so we know we always have to get better. Um, security is a journey, it's not a destination. Um, so we wanna always be trying to get closer, uh, closer, but stay on the journey. Um, and then the last thing is incident response. Um, it's something that's been really important to us over the past few years. Um, because it, like every team is gonna have setbacks, like every team's gonna find something in production that they wish wasn't there. Um, but we have to support them and we have to back them up. Um, so this actually helps um, with safety with our, uh, our teams and our customers um, because the teams know um, that they don't have to be scared to report something. Um, they don't have to be scared to fix something. Um, one really interesting thing about Cloud Foundry is that um, the way we do open source is all of our repositories are public and most teams have public pipelines as well. So I could definitely think of a scenario um, where a team wouldn't want the outside world to know that they had some security bug at all. So they just wouldn't fix it because um, when you commit code, people are watching um, and that's like, that's a scary thing. We don't want teams to not want to fix something because they're afraid they'll get in trouble. Um, I really think that, that any organization can adopt this as a vision for, for security among product teams. I don't think there's anything um, really special in there. Um, even if you have like different practices that you use, I think you can use this sort of thing as a framework. Um, and then, because Justin has had, had so much about the three R's, I'm not gonna talk about that in depth, but I'm gonna talk about a couple practices that we use for continuous improvement and incident response. Um, in a minute. I think these are, these are kind of the values that come out of um, that framework. So we're always trying to be secure by default, we're always trying to get better, um, and we've got your back. So if anything goes wrong, um, we're here to support you. Um, Okay, this is where we started, feeling scared. Um, now people might be feeling a little bit like this. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot, uh, if you have an unhealthy culture that you need to think about changing, um, transformation is hard, it's very tiring. You might not know where to start. So I'm gonna talk about a couple of things that, uh, that we've done. Uh, my disclaimer here um, is that as I said before, we were starting from no culture, right? And it's a lot easier to go from no culture to a healthy culture. It's hard to start in a, an unhealthy place and get to a healthy place. Um, but I think 
what I'm going to talk about in a second is going to be helpful for you because I think you can challenge assumptions you might make about like these are things my team can't do um, because of you know whatever reason. So I think it's good to at least learn um, about what we're doing uh, to build a healthy culture so you can try to do it too. Um, and I'd be happy to take questions at the end about them uh, in case there are uh, specific things that you want to know more about. Um, so the first thing that we did uh, to start building our culture was we basically had an email alias, um, security at pivotal.io. Uh, it was a really big thing for us to start telling everyone in the company, if you have any concerns about security at all, it doesn't need to be a known exploit. You don't need to know if there's even really a vulnerability. Like We just want to hear from you, uh, any opinions you might have, um, any fears. So we started encouraging people to send emails to security at sort of like a see something, say something program. Um, there were definitely a lot of challenges to that. And it was, uh, I wouldn't say it's perfect. Um, we definitely got a lot of emails about um, IT systems that like my team had nothing to do with. Um, things involving like elevators going to the wrong floor. Um, so things that weren't super actionable for us. Um, but it was really interesting, like, as a PCF team, um, trying to improve security at the whole company of Pivotal, like, what sort of things people were reporting. Um, but because we had this, like, fire hose coming in, we had to set up a system to ingest it, and we had to have um, teams to do that, basically. Uh, so that's why we, we formed uh, the security triage team. Uh, it's been really important for Cloud Foundry, and I think one of the things that that sets us apart, especially um, from other teams within Pivotal. Um, so I think it was great that we like did this small step first to open this floodgate, and then we figured out what to do. It wasn't like, let's spend six months like planning resources um, for where this is going to go. We're just going to we're going to wing it. Um, one thing that I heard consistently um, when we started this was feedback from people saying. I'm glad there's someone listening, and I'm glad that you've heard my concern. Um, it's not always about like fixing the thing immediately or trying to prevent work from going to teams. Like, no, we're not going to fix that. It's all about just like making sure that people feel heard and that they know that if they do have a concern, they can report it to you. Um, you want to keep the people reporting things to you happy so that they keep doing it. Um, so as I said, we like because of this, we kind of had to form a security triage team because I definitely couldn't handle all of these emails myself. Um, and that team uh, now kind of works on triage and working on works on tools to help make triage easier. Um, so we're doing kind of the very pivotally thing of like, let's run to the pain. Like this is a super manual process. What can we do to make it better? Um, and I think this is something that like. If your company doesn't do this already, you can definitely do. Set up the, set up the alias, publicize it, uh, and see what happens. Uh, one other thing that we've done is to change um, slash like build a process for how we handle um, internal CVEs that are reported. Um, CVE stands for Common Vulnerabilities and Exposures. Um, it's a way for companies to make public what vulnerabilities exist in their software so the public can know like what new versions to pick up um, to be safe. Um, there's this website called um, cvedetails.com. They have like a leaderboard of top companies um, that have reported individual uh, vulnerabilities. Um, I started in 2016. <laughs> Before that, we you know, did not make the top 50. Um, in 2016, we were number 40 with 21 CVEs. This year, even though the year is not over, um, we've fallen a place, but we've reported 42 CVEs. I think that's also kind of interesting in terms of like you can double the number and we're at the same spot because like so many other people are starting to report a lot of vulnerabilities. Um, I'm happy we're on that list. Like it can be scary, but I think that. Um, it just means that we're transparent about the problems that we find and that we solve. Um, I think other, there are plenty of other companies that should probably be on that list, um, but they're either not finding the vulnerabilities or uh, not publicizing them. 
Okay, so the last thing that I'm gonna talk about are the security workshops that we've started running um, with Cloud Foundry teams. I think these are uh, pretty cool and they're pretty easy to start doing um, within any organization. Um, the goal of these was to both like find vulnerabilities in existing products, but also to just kind of up level the security knowledge on the product teams. Um, because we found that a lot of, um, basically most Cloud Foundry engineers don't have like a specific background or training in security. So we wanted to, to help them get that. Um, and because of just how the way Cloud Foundry works, it didn't really make sense for us to implement like a company-wide training or video or something that like people just watch and like check a box. Like we didn't think that that was actually gonna end up being very effective. Um, because, especially because we wanted to help engineers think in a different way. Um, and just like sitting by yourself at a computer watching a video like doesn't usually help all that much. Um, so these workshops have been an, a, a really huge team effort. Um, and I just wanna thank a bunch of people really quick. Um, Alex Jackson, John Field, Aaron Price, Joe Kerwin. Um, and we've got two cognitive scientists working with us as well. Um, KK Ong and Sean Martin. Um, they've all done like a huge amount of work um, to put these workshops together and help iterate on them. Um, and I was also wanna thank the teams that have actually like gone through them because they've been very, very patient with us. Um, this is like a little bit of what one of the first workshops looked like um, kind of when we got to the end. Um, when we first started doing them, we were really focused on kind of more auditing the product like draw a picture of what your product looks like and we'll spend three or four hours like dissecting every little part of it and coming up with like a million stickies of what we think the risks and mitigations are. Um, so we like, we're trying to find all the vulnerabilities which is not really possible. Um, and we'd also have to like do a really, really lengthy follow up with the team like a week or two later to make sure that like all the things that we found ended up as stories on their backlog. Um, that took a really, really long time and was really labor intensive. And we actually like would come back to teams like a month or two later and like peek in their icebox and see if they did any of the stories. Uh, and they usually didn't. So uh, we needed to start to think about like the actual outcomes. Like what are we trying to get out of these workshops? We realize it's not like just getting to stories in backlogs is not gonna actually get us um, anywhere safer. So we realized that we wanted teams to start thinking about security the way they think about availability or usability. Um, those are just things that are kind of built into every story. Like engineers are very comfortable thinking about like, how is someone actually gonna use this? And like, how would this affect, you know, whether my product is highly available? They're used to thinking about that. Um, and I would argue that that's because those are already like really ingrained in the pivotal culture. So we're trying to make security more ingrained in the culture. Um, especially because like we don't expect teams to like complete a usability review like at the end of a release or at the end of a, you know, when a feature is delivered. Um, we want them to be continuously thinking about it. Um, I wonder if this GIF is gonna work. Yeah, okay. Um, so <laughs> one of the things that we did, um, hopefully you all recognize this as a honey badger. Um, we started incorporating more like exercises about like metaphor and just ways of thinking into the security workshops. Um, so we still did a lot of the training stuff about like what does security mean and what are, um, what are things that make something secure. But we would also just like sit and watch videos over lunch. Um, this, this is part of one of the, the videos where we would watch. It's just about this like honey badger that um, is in a, I think he's in South Africa. And the, the keeper has had all this trouble like getting him to stay in his enclosure. Like he just keeps thinking of like new cool ways to like break out. Um, and it's obviously like he's breaking out of a container. Like it's very easy to, uh, to use this metaphor in like a cloud computing context. Um, and uh, there's also another video we have people watch that's been really successful about um, like physical penetration testing with doors um, and how 
you know, you can think of a lock on a door as something that like secures the door, but no, it really doesn't. Like you can pop the hinges out, you can like slip the latch, you can do all these other things. Um, and I think doing that actually like flips a switch um, in the brains of the teams because it's like, oh, this thing that I like held dear and thought was really, really safe, like it's not safe at all. Like what if my product is like this? Like, you know, what can I do to make my product more safe? Um, and it ends up that like we can spend a lot less time with them like really analyzing their product because they're already motivated um, themselves and uh, I wouldn't say scared. They're like have a little healthy fear about um, how to actually break their products. Um, we're actually working on a new iteration of these workshops coming soon um, that's going to involve more like pairing and like co-teaching so that we can actually like scale this even uh, farther so people can um, teach their own teammates and teach other teams. Cool. Um, so just to remind you, secure by default, always get better. We have your back, very important. Um, I'm hoping that lots of people will steal this uh, and use it on their own teams. Uh, I think I'm gonna end it here. I would be happy to take questions. I think we have like, we might not have any time, but.